it's really amazing actually how many conditions are in the eye. You know, the eye is so small, but there's just so many things that go on with the eye. In fact, a few weeks ago we were having uh, uh, something similar to this about strabismus. Now, strabismus is where the eyes don't go in the same direction, either out or in or up or down. And uh, we had two people who were walking the hall and actually ran into each other and they both fell down and they were pretty upset at each other. And the one said, why don't you look where you're going? And the other said, why don't you go where you're looking? <laughs> <laughs> we like to have some fun too. <laughs> In fact, my family thinks this is what I'm about to talk about today. I had to explain to them that that was not it at all. <laughs> Okay, so the cornea, the cornea is the window, the front part of the eye. It's the first thing after the tear film that light hits when it's entering into the eye. And if you look at the microstructure, this is a little bit of a blurry photo there, I'm sorry. But there are different layers to the cornea. There's the outer layer, the epithelium, there's Bowman's layer. The majority of what you're seeing up there is stroma, and that's collagen. And then you see also decimates there at the bottom. Now if you look more at the collagen, collagen comes, it's tightly bound in fibrils, and then those fibrils combine together to be lamellae, and those lamellae crisscross throughout the cornea and provide strength and support and structure to the cornea. In keratoconus, uh, the hallmark really is thinning, and you can see on the picture there on the left that where the arrow is pointing, that, that portion of the cornea, that's a thin beam of light that's going through the cornea, and that, that portion centrally is much thinner than the, than the areas next to it. And you can compare that to the picture on the right and you can see where we should see a much more uniform thickness as we go down the cornea. So here's a pathology slide. You can see comparing the right side to the left side, uh, that thinning that we're talking about. So keratoconus uh, is a spectrum of, <clears throat> is part of a spectrum of diseases that, that have thinning and protrusion. But they're not inflammatory. So the picture on the left is keratoconus. The picture on the right, we see thinning and protrusion. But this, you can also see a lot of blood vessels. The eye looks more angry and red. And this is thinning uh, due to actually a melt from rheumatoid arthritis. So there are other conditions that can provide similar thinning, but they're inflammatory. The fact that keratoconus is non-inflammatory is one of the reasons why patients with corneal transplants who have keratoconus do much better, and the transplant lasts much longer than patients who have maybe one of these other conditions. So here you can see protrusion. And then protrusion takes on a conical shape. Typically, the cone is just below the midline. And uh, you can see that in these pictures. So there are other conditions that are somewhat similar. Uh, here on the left, we have normal, and you're seeing a cut through the front part of the eye. You can see the iris uh, and the pupil, the hole in the middle. And then on top, we'll talk a little bit later about topography, but you're seeing the topography uh, image of a normal cornea. And the second one is keratoconus. You can see that the, the steepness, that red part on the top image, is more uh, underneath. And we have thinning that is uh, thinning and protrusion that happen about the same place. With uh, the next slide, Pellucid marginal degeneration, which is what PMD stands for, you can see that the red part comes in, it's like a, a claw. We actually call that the crab claw sign. And then you can see that the protrusion is slightly above the area of, um, that's most thin there. And then keratoglobus, which is a condition that people are born with, which is where the entire cornea, not just one portion, the entire cornea is extremely thin. So keratoconus typically has an onset of of puberty. Uh, it's marked by slow, although sometimes rapid progression. And what we have is increasing nearsightedness. Now, the more steep the cornea becomes, the more power it has, and, the, and the, uh, the more the light is bent. And so that's why we have more nearsightedness with progression of keratoconus. Also have a lot more astigmatism, which is one of the clinical hallmarks of this disease. And it can become stationary at any time. So Dr. Garg is going to talk more about cross-linking, but we talked about the fibrils before. You can see that in the upper right, and you can see a cartoon of this here. But the more links between these fibrils, the more strength that we have in the cornea. And the reason I'm bringing this up now when we're talking about progression is that most patients will typically auto-cross-link by their 40s or so, uh, just from being out in UV light and, and from what we eat in our diet. And so that's one of the reasons we believe that the progression halts in, in midlife. 
Both eyes are affected. Now, one eye may be affected much more than the other. And before we had the ability to really scan the cornea, we thought that maybe it was just a one-sided disease. But even in patients who have keratoconus on one side, if you scan the cornea, you see that the other eye is affected to some, some degree. And it's an unclear hereditary. Some diseases in medicine, we can say, well, this gene equals this. If you have this, then automatically your kid will have it or not. It's a little more unclear in terms of keratoconus. There are some associations with hereditary. They've done studies looking at identical twins. And some of them do have a keratoconus, and some of them don't. Uh, in patients who have this, it's been estimated that on average, you know, 10% or less of their children may get this. So there are some associations. Now, systemically, uh, Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos Marfan, the last <coughs> few of those are conditions where collagen is weak and more stretchy anyway. So that makes sense that they have a higher risk of keratoconus. With atopy or allergy, if someone is constantly rubbing the eyes, that also makes sense that it could wear down the strength of the cornea. Uh, but typically, it's not just if you rub your eyes, you're going to get keratoconus. You have to have some kind of risk factor for that. Uh, Ocular-wise, uh, vernal is another type of disease that causes a lot of itching, as was, uh, or rubbing of the eye, as is labor's congenital amaurosis. So one of some of the things that we see when we're looking through that awfully bright light in your eyes. So one thing that we can look for are called volt striae. You can see these, these vertical lines in the cornea. And those are tension lines of some of the fibrils or lamellae in the cornea because of the bulging. Those, you know, we're seeing these particular lines. Interestingly, if you touch the cornea and push on it, these lines disappear. And when you let go, they come back. If you look really closely, and I started with this picture, but it's also really hard to see in real life as well you can see a faint yellow line right below uh, that arrow. And that's an iron line. Now, when tears uh, are on the corneal surface that's abnormal, they tend to deposit iron in particular places where that abnormality is. And so we're seeing here what's called a flasher ring, named after someone, but just iron deposit on the cornea. As things progress, uh, we can have scarring. And uh, so here you're seeing some scarring. This typically happens at the apex. Again, I told you that keratoconus, the thinning and the apex are the same place typically. And that uh, the innermost layer of the cornea, decimase membrane, if the progression keeps going, can actually burst. And when that, when that bursts, you can have scarring there. You can actually have microbursts and have my, kind of smaller scars. But you can have high drops, which is where you have that burst. Fluid rushes into the cornea, and you have an acute uh, decrease in your vision, but that typically clears up but may leave a scar like this. So from a clinical standpoint though, one of the most difficult things to deal with is astigmatism. And if you look at that light rays coming in on a normal cornea, they're going to focus exactly where they need to. They may need a little help from glasses, but in a keratoconic patient and a keratoconic eye, those light rays are going all over the place. So let's talk just a little bit about astigmatism. Now, I apologize if some of this is really basic. But that's what I was assigned to do. It's very basic. So we'll get to more uh, advanced topics soon. Astigmatism has to do with the shape of the cornea. Now, uh, if you imagine a, a basketball, if you're standing on top of a basketball, any direction that you move is going to take you down a slope that's going to be the exact same slope as any other direction you move on top of that basketball. However, if you're on a football, that's not true. You may take one path that's going to take you down a very steep slope, and another path that will take you down not as steep a slope. The difference in the two is astigmatism. And you can see and you can see that with these images here. So we measure this using the same kind of topography uh, that, that we use when you go hiking. I don't know if anyone's ever seen one of these maps. You go hiking and you want to know how high the area uh, is that you're going to be at. You could look at a topography, uh, uh, a topography map like this. And the closer the lines are together, the steeper that area is. So we do the same thing. You see the image on the right? We shine light in uh, rings on the cornea, and then we see how close they are. And because it gets a little hard to look at those rings and determine exactly what's going on, we have a computer analyze it, and it puts it into a color format, which is what you see the doctors pull up when you go in to get your scan. So let's delve a little bit more into astigmatism, different types of astigmatism. Now, we would call something regular if the amount on the top is the same, or it is 180 degrees from the amount on the bottom. You can see that uh, my cartoon on the right there, that's just 180 <laughs> degrees apart. So that's regular astigmatism. 
And that regular stigmatism can be symmetric, like on the top, where you have the same amount on the top or on the bottom, or it can be asymmetric. You can see on the bottom there in the blue triangles that the top of the blue triangle is much smaller than the bottom of the blue triangle. So that's more classic of keratoconus would be the bottom here. And then irregular, where it's just, there's no real pattern to it. So keratoconus may start out more regular and symmetric, typically progresses to be asymmetric, and then uh, in advanced cases can be uh, irregular. So what are some treatments? I'm just going to briefly touch on some of the different treatment options for keratoconus. And one of those is cross-linking. You'll hear a lot about that today. It's a very exciting technology um, that strengthens the bonds between the collagen fibrils. And typically for patients who have more early or progressive uh, keratoconus, if it's not progressing anymore, you probably don't need this. If you're later on in life, you may have already, like I said, auto uh, cross-link. Uh, but this is exciting to me because in patients who are young, who we see early signs of keratoconus, we finally have a chance to halt, we think, progression of this before patients need uh, more further and more, more invasive uh, treatment. So if you look at treatment options, if you have regular stigmatism like we see here, you can have any of these treatment options, but you'll do very well with glasses. Glasses correct regular symmetric stigmatism like this very well. As it becomes regular and asymmetric, you can still do well in glasses. Many keratoconus patients do very well in glasses <coughs> despite having a lot of asymmetry there. Maybe looking more towards contact lenses, and if it's a very high amount of stigmatism, you may be looking towards a corneal transplant. And then with irregular, we're looking not so much with the glasses, but more contacts and more uh, transplant options. So to look at that in another way, for glasses, we can treat regular and some mild irregular stigmatism. Uh, the contacts provide uh, treatment past that, and they really just vault over the surface. You can see here, uh, the gray area on the bottom is the cornea, and then that, uh, the two lines on top that are vaulted over that are as a, the front and the back side of a contact lens. So you can see that there's space between the contact and the cornea. This is a sclerovaulted contact lens, and it's providing two light coming towards the eye, a perfectly round surface. Now, when light comes to the eye, the physics of light is that it is bent the most when it changes the substance, uh, the density of substances that it's in. So if it comes from air to the tear film or to the cornea, that's when it bends a lot. When it's going through the eye and it goes through fluid in the lens, it bends some after that, but two-thirds of the bending or the focusing power of the eye happens when the air hits the tear film slash cornea because the, cor the tears are on the cornea. Now, if you have a contact lens, you just recreate a perfectly round surface in front of that, and that's why patients can see so much better uh, if they can fit one of these with a the contact lens. Intacts, I don't know if anyone will be talking about intacts today. Intacts are a, a treatment op, uh, modality that we have for, for uh, keratoconus. And even some patients who have keratoconus and it's stable and are doing fairly well in glasses can be good candidates for toric lens during cataract surgery. Um, this can be either, like I said, just stable keratoconus or also I think Dr. Gard will talk something somewhat about this and after transplant surgery, if there's a lot of astigmatism from the transplant, we can treat some of that with a toric lens as well. And then of course, corneal transplants. Um, and Dr. Freed will be talking more about that. So a lot of treatment options. Uh, and it may be confusing. I know I've had patients come to me and say, Doc, I went to this other doctor and they said, on the one hand, you could get glasses. On the other hand, you could get contact lenses. And I went to another one and they said, on the one hand, you could get cross-link. On the other hand, you could get a corneal transplant. And finally they said, Doc, I just need a doctor who only has one hand. So they can tell me what to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> With that, thank you very much, and I'll turn the time over uh, to our next speaker.